Welcome, friends, to Breakfast in the Ruins, a Michael Moorcock flavoured podcast. Well, it's 2021 at last, so it should have been really great to see the back of 2020. A uh, rather unusual year, as most of us would agree. But sadly, 2021 has turned out so far to be an even bigger clusterfuck than 2020. What a palaver. How incredibly satisfying, then, that after the Hawkwind episode with Ian Abrahams was so well received, we're seeing more fabulous moorcock inspired music emerging, a lot of it on Bandcamp, including our very own compadres from the good ship Donblas, Dave and Nathan with their projects, Cernus and Coram. Now we gave Cernus a bit of airplay on the last show, the 2020 Moorcock Birthday Special. So this time around we're going to take a look at the Coram project, brainchild of Nathan Gullias, and he will play us out at the end of the show. First up though, we're stepping away from the rock to look at some very tasty electronica as I have a conversation with Dungeon Synth artist Elric. Dungeon Synth isn't something I know too much about, but it's electronic, and in this case directly inspired by Michael Moorcock, so it is firmly in my wheelhouse. In fact, my earliest memories of electronic music are listening to Pops play his home-built electric organ in the 70s, back at Alliance Avenue, so I reckon that counts. And please don't at me about the difference between electric and electronic. The artist called Elric came to my notice sometime last year when one of the Twitter gang linked to his Bandcamp page, which you can find at elricstormbringer.bandcamp.com. At the moment, Bandcamp is my go-to source for just about everything music-related these days. It's an absolute treasure trove. And if you do get a taste for Dungeon Synth, it's a real rabbit hole of wonders. And of course, you can find on there Mike Moorcock's collaborations with not only The Deep Fix, but also... Don Falcone's project, Spirits Burning, which includes former members of Blue Oyster Cult. Two albums on there, well worth checking out. Anyway, I dropped the artist a line via Bandcamp's contact page, and we've had a great back and forth as we've talked inspirations and other bits and bobs. But as the artist called Elric isn't of this sphere, we've used a slightly different method of interview, with him broadcasting his responses via relays on Earths 5, 7 and 13, in a form of an RSA encryption to ensure any interception by the adjusters of the D-squads don't expose his position. I've decoded and reconstructed it as best I can with my limited knowledge of such things, and, given the intermittent but increasingly violent impact of the ongoing UMS, this is the best we can do for now, so check that out after the first transition. Also, this show will see the return of the journal of Gerard Arthur Connolly. The journal has had a total refresh and overhaul sound-wise, care of the very talented NAND Soundtracks, itself the cover identity of an old buddy of mine from back in my salad days. We reconnected a few months back on Twitter, and this collaboration has been the result so far, and there's more to come. Amazingly, we haven't actually had an in-person conversation, even over video call or phone, for almost 28 years. The wonders of technology. We'll fix that soon, and maybe I'll even convince him to come on the show to explain his process and tell us what he reckons to the Moorcock recommendation I gave him. Anyway, enough of my yakking for now. Join me as I head up to the roof garden, twiddle the knobs on the giant Multiversatron 5000, and talk first up to the artist called Elric. Welcome to Breakfast in the Ruins and Derry and Tom's Roof Garden. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on. So let's just kick off, as I usually do, with all my new guests. What's your history with Moorcock? I have to admit I got into Moorcock pretty late in the game. I knew of him through Hawkwind, but really the issue was for a very long time I only read on fiction, always doing research, reading philosophy at satire. I called it a fiction complex, where I neglected fiction to my own detriment, with very few exceptions, Dostoevsky, or well, most of Tolkien for example, a few others. Then someone with good taste Heil recommended him, lent me Elric of Melibone, and the rest is history. 
now, of course, I properly appreciate Murcock and recognize his place among the top echelons of artistic master, and full respect to him for being an unrepentant anarchist. Moorcock's self-identification as an anarchist is one of the many draws for a lot of people of my generation and political slant. Take Scott's to be an anarchist. You mentioned a few other fiction authors above, but who else really floats your boat and inspires you artistically? Who would you recommend to our listeners? Herbert, Moorcock and Tolkien are the ruling triumvirate as far as I'm concerned. The first four Dune books are gospel to me. Lovecraft is a close runner-up. At the Mountains of Madness is untouchable, I read it again every year or so. Plus Clark Ashton Smith, Thomas Ligotti, that whole cosmic horror vibe. Steven Erickson merits a place at the table. He writes some of the best new high fantasy going, although I haven't made it through the entire series yet. Graham Hancock. Though he's known for his investigative research and non-fiction mostly, his fiction writing is extremely underrated. War God series, Entangled, very good stuff. Other notable mentions include Ursula K, George R. R. Asimov, PKD, Carl Sagan, Contact Alone was good enough to include him in this fiction list, Gene Wolfe, Gary Jennings, Shelley, Poe. I've had Neil Stevenson an Atham on deck for a while, we'll get to it soon. Supposed to be worth the distance. Umberto Eco, Name of the Rose, great book. I'm sure I'm forgetting someone important, haha. <laughs> Anyone you'd recommend? I still most read on fiction. My go-to recommendations for folks would generally be the same Dune books. I couldn't really get on with Heretics and Chapter House, although I will try again at some point. You've already mentioned Clark Ashton Smith and Ligotti, but I would definitely throw William Hop Hodgson your way. Fascinating character that sits between Robert W. Chambers and Lovecraft in terms of timeline and activity. Sadly, he died in World War I in his early 30s, yet still leaves a pretty substantial body of work comparable to those other two, but with a really unique voice. And much like Robert E. Howard later, he dabbled in all kinds of genres for magazines and penny dreadfuls, but his voice and style was strongest in his weird fiction and supernatural nautical tales. When it comes to influential authors, I was introduced in the early 80s by Pops, my granddad, and he's right up there. All his gear has been collected by Nightshade Books. Excellent additions all. My intro was The House on the Borderlands. I'm definitely going to track down some Hodgson, sounds right up my style, and give those Corum and Soda Spans a listen, so thanks for the links and recommendations. As it happens, I also went down the Graham Hancock rabbit hole back in the day, thanks to my uncle lending me the Mars mystery. As I was still expanding my mind <laughs> on a regular basis. It felt revelatory to me. Not so much all of the grand designs and ideas he drew from everything he touched upon, but more the little pieces, like the stuff in Fingerprints of the Gods about the Piri Reis and Arantius Phineas maps and the US Geological Project mapping Antarctica in the 50s. Wild stuff. Never tried his fiction, though. Oh shit, don't get me started on Graham Hancock's legacy civilization investigations. I'll rant for 100 pages, haha. <laughs> Actually, I've filled up multiple journals, literally hundreds of pages, with my ideas and research on the subject. Archaeology and comparative mythology in the context of Gobekli Tepe, kind of thing. I'll agree some slash many of his conclusions from the data are a bit naive, in my opinion, but his general premise has been largely vindicated, most notably the younger driver's impact hypothesis. As far back as 2007 when the first peer-reviewed papers began accumulating, he clearly understood the implications of the emerging data. Flash forward, of course now, 
since November 2018, and the confirmation of a high west crater in Greenland dating back to 12,900 YA. The event, which initiated the climactic convulsions at the end of the last ice age, megaphone extinction, and so on has its causal agent, the so-called smoking gun. He's been treated really brutally by academia, just a shame, because he seems like a really good dude. But the paradigm has shifted, that event really happened, and humans were there to witness it, experience it, remember it, pass that memory to future generations in the form of oral stories. Wild. Okay I got to cut it short on this stuff, but while in Rome, Shout out to John Anthony West, Arash Waller, Lubix, Flinders Petrie, and all the late great pioneers of the subject. Dig into their work, it's worth it. Yeah, here in the UK he had a couple of short series on Channel 4 in the 90s, mainly around the lost civilization theories. Short while later the BBC had a Horizon documentary, at least I think it was Horizon, from memory that was really just a brutal hatchet job, full of openly scornful archaeologists and anthropologists. It was actually quite unpleasant. They went for Hancock and his overarching theories, but kind of conspicuously failed to address any of the myriad of the jigsaw pieces that, on their own merit, were quite hard to dispute. For example, Robert Schock's geological work on the Sphinx, or any of the bits previously mentioned. He seems to be doing okay, though. I still haven't got all the way through his book on shamanism and psychedelics, uh, Supernatural, from the mid-2000s. I really should try and catch up with what he's doing. Yeah, it is definitely a fiendishly complex jigsaw puzzle, waiting to be pieced together. We just need some pattern recognition prodigies who aren't biased by career, ego, money. The deeper one dives into history, working back century by century, millennia by millennia, you eventually get to the grey area where history bleeds into mythology. And mythology, let us be clear, is not fiction. It is closer to history than fiction, and to pull the history out of it requires a specialist, a mytho-historian. The method is reasonably simple. Place all the data, all the mythologies of all the disparate civilizations into sort of Venn diagram, and see what lies at the center. I really think some higher technologies were present deep in the past, but were secret and highly coveted, rather than democratized, like it has been to a large degree the last few hundred years, though not entirely of course, as we all know militaries have technologies decades in advance of consumer versions. The use of electricity for example, was an occult for many thousands of years likely known to an extremely exclusive inner circle, the gods of lightning. As above so below, though it has meaning on men levels, for one it could imply a technology cult with lenses, microscopes and telescopes, extremely cloistered and secret, but confirming a below world of microorganisms at the cellular level, a little universe alive inside of us. And conversely, observations at the cosmic scale, an above world, eerily mirroring the microcosmic and macrocosmic scales. That said, it also may be that meditative, yogic insight, in the style of a Vedant, was what brought the ancients to claim confidently that the universe is 13.75 billion years old, and will last for 311 billion 40 million years before its eventual heat death. Figures which were derided by Western colonizers as obvious exaggerations, until of course late 20th century science finally caught up to the knowledge of 5000 plus YA. Men claim frankly that looking inside, rather than material technology, telescopes, electron microscopes etc. was the way such profound and accurate knowledge was acquired in the past. Something great has been lost. We are like orphaned children, not knowing of our parents, our origins, and strangely compelled to find out. I imagine the times before the end of the last ice age as a literal Conan-style age of sword and stone. Neanderthals, Denisovans, Homo Florsiensis, Cro-Magnon, all living together in one messy time. 
a world begins to emerge of humans, halflings, giants, megafauna. Even science is beginning to call it a Lord of the Rings style world that we emerged from. And all this is embedded in the oral stories, cherished as holy, passed on for thousands of years. I think Elric and many other characters conjured in the mind of Michael Moorcock would have been right at home in that very real world, lost to history. Now, the Hoover Dam. The Hoover Dam was built to last unmaintained for 10,000 years. Think about that. I'll wait. In the year 10,000, the Hoover Dam will be unrecognizable. So what other than stories do we really expect to find from 12,000 plus years ago? Potsherds. Trash. No. All that will remain of pre-plastic civilization in 12,000 years are the massive cornerstones of the megalithic structures. What do we find? Precisely that. I'm not talking crystal computers, or a Disney-style Atlantean world. But some degree of concentrated populations, cities, technologies, culture, potentially something not far short of where we were at the beginning of the 20th century. An era the human store has been lost. Civilization did not begin with Sumer. So much more to say. But I'll shut up. And rant. So, as well as a deep thinker, you're evidently a talented musician and composer, but not the first to be influenced by Michael Moorcock, and we'll get to your work shortly. But how do you feel about the broad bodies of work out there over the last 50 years or so, and how his work is interpreted? Thanks. Well, most of my knowledge of Moorcock in culture is from the legendary Hawkwind record. Surprising more metal bands don't mind the Moorcock multiverse for content. I had an ex-girlfriend who used to tell me I reminded her of Elric of Melibone, funnily enough. But I didn't know who it was at the time, and only it clicked way later when I got into the books and project. I then started to really wonder why Moorcock never made it into video game and cartoon culture in the 80s and 90s in a comprehensive way. Like, NES Elric. Come on, that could have been a top game for 8 or 16-bit console. Hell, I would have loved an Elric ZX Spectrum game back in the day, as the faithful old Specky was my entry into the world of computers. I never actually had a console system until adulthood. Back in the 80s I was playing games on this old Commodore Amiga 500. It was cutting edge. This one game, Fairy Tale Adventure, is perhaps the greatest video game soundtrack of all time. Got to check it out. The designer Taylin, aka David Joyner, is an absolute genius. He programmed the game and composed the music in seven months. And he also designed the Music X software for the Amiga system. The game might seem light by today's standards. But it was one of the first ever open world action RPG, way ahead of its time. A cult gem to retro gamers in the know. I was young, it was a very formative time, but it, if wasn't for that game, my musical mind would not be what it is. Nor my taste for dark medieval themes. There are a few very cool mock-up inspired projects emerging at the moment. A couple of the show's patrons, in fact, are producing some space rock and power metal, and they're both on Bandcamp, Cernus, and Corum. I'll send you the links. Otherwise, though, outside of Hawkwind and Blue Oyster Cult, there does seem to be a dearth of Moorcock metal, notwithstanding the odd track by the likes of Diamond Head. Mostly, he seems to have been a source of album covers via Rodney Matthews, or influences in other minor ways. UK Nawabam Band, Tigers of Pantang, for example, who I remember being extremely disappointed by as a teenager when the connection never went further really than the band name. Spellbound by Tigers of Pantang is one of my favourite records, by the way. I am a big new wave of British heavy metal fan.
How did you come to be a musician in the first place? Parents put me in piano lessons at age five. Since then, picked up many other instruments. And how did the Elric Project come about? As I said, the first book was lent to me. A conduct had a bunch of Moorcock books, like 30 to 40 of them, and I was intrigued. Asked where a good place to start was, they lent me the first Elric. Walking home that night, the book, the whole situation, had a strange mystique to it. Getting home, I sat down to read. It was a gloomy night, uncharacteristically cold for the climate, with a bitter wind raging, shaking the windows and doors. Opening the book, reading the first line. It is the color of bleached skull, his flesh. The overture immediate and full formed began playing. Half a sentence in, I put down the book, somewhat stunned to be honest. The aesthetic moment was one of near rapture. I let it play for a bit, and then committed it to sheet music, just the simple AB structure, with some elaborations. At that point, I was struck with the inspiration to compose an organic soundtrack to the book, stopping and committing to sheet whenever an episode generated a new composition. So yeah, the first Elric album was written in real time as I read the book. I was first directed to your music by a pal on Twitter. It was referred to as Dungeon Synth. DS for life. I'm of an age to have fond memories of the beeps and boops of the ZX Spectrum, but I probably lost touch with home computers and consoles by the time games had really great soundtracks. But I can nevertheless fully appreciate them and the style, being a fan of electronic and ambient music in general. How would you describe Dungeon Synth to the uninitiated? A great definition of DS was left as a comment on my Corum YouTube page, another partial spoiler for you. For me, Dungeon Synth has always been about a technologic transfiguration of dark fantasy, a cybernosis performed by nihilistic bards through complex, alchemical apparatus of sound production. In its similarity to primitive, epic video game OSTs, it embodies this ethos in a very satisfying way. DS was started by Scandinavian black metal musicians in the 90s. This mega douchebag, who happens to be the greatest black metal artist of all time, went to prison and didn't have guitars so he pumped out a couple of synth records. Brilliant stuff. Get on it. Other members of that scene were also making forays away from guitars. One Raven, Neptune Towers, Mordis, are some of the heavyweights. Dungeon Synth Real had a strong second wave come about five to six years ago that continues to this day, lots of fantastic bards making alchemical soundscapes. What a time to be alive. You have three albums on Bandcamp, under the Elric title. The last uploaded two years ago. Do you have any more in the pipeline, or any other projects ongoing? Well, there are other Elric albums. Four secret ones and then four sub-secret ones. So yeah, there are 11 releases I consider formally from the Elric project, though only three of them have the Elric title. The main project is the three Elric albums, and the other stuff should more or less be considered demos and bonus material. Partial spoiler on my Discogs page. Next hints. The sub-secret ones are not more cock-themed, uh, Hawkmoon. I'll link to the Discogs page on the blog, but I can anticipate some of the questions that will come in, and this is one that I fully share. Are any of those exclusive Hawkmoon cassettes that are mentioned still available, and how else can we get access to the music? Or are they only existed in the hands of a few lucky travellers somewhere in the million spheres? Sorry, no more Hawkmoon cassettes. They were uber-limited. The Coram album is digital only, available on YouTube. And the Direcos is hard copy only, and not sure when that one will surface. So yeah, there are records for all four Eternal Champion incarnations. The Murkok Multiverse, Eternal Champion series, is to me like the ring cycle of fantasy, an obscenely ambitious, visionary achievement. I did soundtracks to all four, but Elric connected with me on the deepest level. 
the whole culture of Melibone, the ambivalent moral philosophy, the recklessness of an anti-hero. Maybe I'm just biased towards a long-haired chaos reaping albino. Ha ha. Coram and the Mad aren't far behind, highly sophisticated artist and fearless warrior. I absolutely loved the unfinished symphony idea at the start, casually leaving it behind to follow destiny. Hawkmoon, though an excellent series of books, the character himself is a bit of a dumb jock type, act I'll think later. Great reads, but a bit less inspiring, and I think the quality of the releases reflects that hierarchy. Elric. Corum. Hawkmoon. Erechos. Erechos, though in a way the most fundamental character, carrying member of his incarnations, and all, those books just brought forth less sounds from the fourth dimension. Who knows? I have to say, I told my mate Hussein, one of my occasional co-hosts, about your tapes, and in particular how cool and mysterious the Hartman cassettes are, and he's declared you to be the Moorcock Banksy. Ha ha, that's hilarious. I met Banksy once. Or else someone just pretending to be Banksy, who knows. But it was a pretty convincing encounter, and in a rare context that he might have revealed himself in a one-on-one -on -one scenario. I guess, if his face ever becomes public I'll know one way or another. Part of me thinks there is no Banksy, and it's a cover term for collective of several artists, probably rotational. So what are you working on now, and what do you have planned for the future? Most of the synth stuff I do is stream of consciousness and unedited. I sometimes go back and add an additional voice, but very rarely make changes after the fact. That's how I'm so fast at composing. Throw it down. Move on. It might give a superficial cheapness to some of it, but is compensated I think by giving it a real honesty. Elric like most DS, is intentional raw, minimalist, designed very consciously to encapsulate the vibe of 80s video games and 70s fantasy. But I do other more technical music too, non-linear stuff, and black metal. I compose every day as a rule, but am not really releasing material at the moment. I'm working on having some of my string quartets performed acoustically, stuff influenced by Beethoven's late work. As well as studying a few choice JS matchworks for classical guitar, which is my main squeeze. Huge thanks for spreading the word of Moorcock, and as well thanks for your interest in the music, it is appreciated. Thanks for joining me in Virtual Derry and Tom's. It's been a real pleasure. Okay, we're back in virtual Derry and Tom's, and my guest right now is Nathan, who's behind the Corum Metal Project. Now, we might get down into classifications and names and descriptions of the type of rock a little bit further on, because I must say, when it comes to subclassifications of music and other bits and bobs, it's not really up my street, but that's why we're talking to you today, so I'm really looking forward to it. Thanks ever so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you, and also because Loz and I this weekend will be recording The Night of the Swords Part 3, it's a perfect time for us to talk about your project, Corum. Yeah. So generally, what I always kick off with with a new guest is just to talk about, first of all, what's your history with fantastic fiction and Moorcock in particular? Okay, well, um, it's quite a journey for me. Um, it started, um, I'd say back in 2010, was when I would really started really getting into um 
that the fiction uh, pretty much started with uh, Free Comic Book Day in uh, Melbourne, my favorite comic book store in um, in the city, Comics Are Us, and going in there on Free Comic Book Day and seeing Solomon Kane. So really, uh, Robert E. Howard is uh-huh. pretty much where it all began. Yeah, uh, for me picking up uh issue number one uh, dark horse they one of their um reboots of the solomon kane series and really getting into that and then from that that just kind of um spiraled into the i guess down the rabbit hole of um pulp fiction fantasy pulps um which i love um getting into solomon kane conan and um of course that just uh, uh, lovecraft and that just ended up michael moorcock and um you know getting into hit i started with um the, the Elric uh, Fortress of the Pearl, because... Um, oh, that's a tough one to start with. Yeah, and um, the, the the thing with the Elric, um, I guess the chronology of that series uh, is, is fucking confusing, to say the least. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, that's where I started, and I absolutely loved it, because I'm a huge fan of um, pulp noir, you know, characters like Philip Marlowe, you know, Raymond Chandler, and... Um, other pulp sort of characters, um, the shadow, big, yeah. you know, yeah. big love of mine. And so I really, really loved um, Fortress of the Pearl because it had that sort of uh, fantasy take on the noir genre, which I yeah. really, really, um, really, you know, I loved it. So uh, it just, that's how I got into it, basically. Um, and you know what? It's been a long time since I read The Fortress of the Pearl. I read it when it came out and... It's from a time when Moorcock's style was very much changing. It was the first of a, really his, his, his modern run of, of Elric novels, even though chronologically, I think it's his gap year, isn't it? After, yeah. after yeah, Elric of Mount right. Day, where he, goes on, um, he, he puts Yakun back on the throne and goes on his gap year. Yeah, so it's it's kind of a, a sequel, I yeah. guess? Yeah, uh, so cr- chronologically, while it sits very early in the sequence, it's probably in the last third in terms of when it was written but i must say at the time i did really really struggle with it largely mm. because i kicked off with murcock with the really quick snappy 60s stuff like warlord of the air and stormbringer stormbringer of course right. was the first elric novel i read which was yeah. sequentially the last but one of the earliest written so to dive in with fortress of the pearl that's a that's a pretty good introduction right and um you know and that's the thing um it it really has that pulpy feel to it, and, and I think that's where I uh, really connected with, you know, the character there. Yeah. And one of my favorite characters in all of fantasy sort of fiction is Solomon Kane. Mm-hmm. I love that the 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 you know, pulp heroes from that sort of classic fantasy literature. Yeah. And and so you know, uh, that really uh, I I see a lot of you know that sort of pulpy nature in there. So. Yeah. yeah, I'm a massive fan of Solomon Kane, and actually the Dark Horse comics that you're referring to, I, I picked them up um, in the collected volumes. In fact, they're not too far away from me now, but mm. they're just hidden behind piles of other books. And I read them when we were on holiday in the wilds of Scotland many years mm. ago in a, in a cottage, and I thought they were really good adaptations. Yeah, are you talking about the, um, the P. Craig Russell? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, I love that. That's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, really good stuff. And and Solomon Kane is, is one of the characters I've always really enjoyed because, and I think this is where the movie fell down, is because he's kind of a, an inscrutable, um, fully formed character the moment he arrives. Um, and I've, I, I quite enjoyed the movie, but they, they made an attempt to try and give him a backstory and, and, and made the typical superhero mistake of having an origin story. Mm. But one, um, once he was fully formed... I thought that was quite successful, but it's just such a shame there were so few short stories. Mm, I I quite love them. I like the movie a lot. So, um, but um, yeah, you're right. It it is it's a different take, kind of, because he seems a bit more mopey and and miserable in that movie. But um, I think yeah, it does a decent job of setting up a, a backstory for a character that doesn't really need one. Yeah. So um, yeah. I enjoyed it, and I thought Purefoy was pretty good as well. Oh uh, yeah, he was brilliant. Yeah. So when it comes to Moorcock, then you started with Fortress of the Pearl, but how, yeah, how did you get on with the other stuff? And do you have a favourite? Um, well, yeah, I I uh, ended up getting getting to Sailor um Sailors on the Seas of Fate, which I absolutely adore. I love mm-hmm. that book, and I love the adaptations of um the I think they were Marvel adaptations in the seventies and eighties. Uh, the Roy um, Thomas one, I think, was was it First Comics or something like that. 
Um, I think we saw yeah. the Elric. I've, I've, in fact, I've got those somewhere to hand as well. I've got the Elric yeah. and the and the Sailor and the Caesar Fate with the peak Craig Russell covers. But yeah, the Roy Thomas adaptations, I think they were done by First Comics. But I'm not a massive comic geek. So. Yeah, I've, I've been... Um... I've been I've collecting the reprints that Titan Comics have been putting out, the Moorcock Library collection that they've been doing in these really nice hardcovers. Ooh, and nice. Uh, I love those. They're, they're brilliant. So that um, really, those books is kind of what really um, inspired me to go, you know, I'm, I want to uh, do some music. I want to do something a, a little bit more, you know, because um, yeah. I really enjoy ex- exploring that universe and exploring those characters, um, particularly the Eternal Champion stuff. Mm. Um yeah. yeah, we'll 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 talk a bit about your music uh, as as we go along because of course that's why that's why we're here. Um, but mocock has got like a long relationship with rock music. What what for yeah. you are the most successful examples of Moorcocky and rock? I think uh, Blue Oyster Cult. Um, mm-hmm. I think Deep Purple. A big one for me is the Sereth Ungol, the American um, metal band from the seventies yeah. and eighties. Yeah. Um, huge influence of mine. So yeah. Yeah, and of course, they all their album covers were basically the Michael Wheel and Panther paperback covers, weren't they? Which yes, is what, which is what attracted me to them in the first place. I I love that actually. Um, they put out an album last year, um, called Forever Black, I believe, and uh, there's a song in there called Stormbringer, and oh. again, Alric art as Alric on the cover. Um, but it, yeah, if anyone hasn't checked that album out yet and is a fan, I highly recommend it. It is awesome. <laughs> I've completely missed out on that. I didn't even realise they were still going. So I'm gonna to have to get my head yeah. down and fig- and find that. Oh one yeah, out. they're still going. They they even put out a single, I think, in 2019. They're yeah, sounding really, really great. All right, cool. Well, I'll definitely look into that. Um, funnily enough, I was just having a, a conversation with um, someone else who's producing um, Elric focused music, and and they asked me what was out there in terms of metal. And if I'd have realised Sirith Ungol were were still at it, I would have definitely thrown them into the mix. So. Perhaps we should oh, yeah. have had this conversation before I spoke to him. But anyway, these are the way things go, aren't they? <laughs> so how did you become a musician yourself? Well, I started when I was pretty young. Um, so I think I, I think I would just started high school and um and I, I'm I'm a big I'm a big gamer. I yeah. love uh, old school video games. If anyone has seen my social media, you know I love I grew up on the sort of what I like to call the you know, the golden age of PC gaming. So, you know, the mid to late nineties, early two thousands uh, PC gaming, you know, games like Doom and um, Half Life and things like that. Yeah. And um, that style of music just sort of really resonated with me, and I realized, oh, hang on, that's that's metal. That's what heavy metal is, you know. Mm. Um, particularly Doom. Um, and then just growing up on different sort of artists, um, different metal bands, you know, big ones, um, Alice Cooper, Except, Judas Priest, Maiden, Motorhead, you know, all all that's uh, you know. Th- classic sort of heavy metal stuff. And um, yeah, I started learning guitar. Um, you know, Lucky had a, um, one of my dad's good friends um, was a guitarist and a guitar teacher. And yeah, just over the years, just banging away on the guitar and mostly just focusing on, you know, metal, speed metal, power metal, all that mm-hmm. sort of stuff. And yeah, that's pretty much, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's interesting it. you should mention um, video games. I mean, you know, I, 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 <laughs> I'm old enough that my formative years with video games were things like Rebel Star on the ZX Spectrum <laughs> in about 1984. <laughs> but I was playing PC games in the 90s, and I remember when, when Doom came around, and I, I can remember um, I came across the shareware version on PC back in those great days when you got shareware versions. And I think shareware version of Doom and Quake, you had about the first quarter of the game. Mm. But um, I was really attracted to, to Doom because of the that kind of lo-fi soundtrack and then later on it came out on the playstation and i have very fond memories of playstation one being at my friend's house down in london and would um, partake in of um, some peculiar substances and we had two old massive tvs back to back and two playstations back to back plugged into each other and there was half a dozen of us on one side of the room and half a dozen of us on the other side all cheering <laughs> on the person with the uh, with, <laughs> with the controller but the playstation soundtrack was amazing it yeah was so much better than the pc one it was absolutely it, fantastic i think it was more atmospheric wasn't it on the playstation yeah it had really weird things like babies crying like really low in the mix and, and yeah all, all all sorts of really weird things that that could freak you out if you played it in a dark room on your own. 
And then, of course, later on, I think, what was it? Quake, Quake came out with the Trent Reznor soundtrack. Oh, yeah, yeah. Which was amazing. Um, and then Doom came out, which basically just had a hard hard metal soundtrack that didn't really pay any attention whatsoever to what was going on the screen. It was just from mm. the very outset. It was, bang, this game is heavy metal. And it was. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm still a massive fan of Quake 2 right now, and I don't bother with any of the mods. I'll just go back and play it raw from time to time. I love it. Love it to mm. bits. So... Let's talk Corum then and your, your project. How, how did it come about and how do you set up about accomplishing like that kind of vision from, from scratch? Yeah, um, well, it started about two years ago when, you know, when I was really getting into the um, Moorcock sort of discography, I guess. Yeah. Um, and I just, I, I thought to myself, you know, I wanted to do something that would, um, I guess, have a perspective on that sort of, universe um so i was thinking maybe tracks um i think originally i started out kind of conceptualizing a concept album that would sort of take you through the story of um, eternal champions and things like that and just thinking you know how the hell am i gonna do this and eventually i just kind of landed on sort of hard rock kind of speed medley um power medley kind of tracks and settling with the name Corum because I felt like, you know, Corum as a character within the sort of, I guess, the pantheon of the Moorcock characters, he kind of hits a, a nice, um, I guess, a, a mid-range kind of, I guess he's like the, the perfect balance of the characters because, you know, mm. Alric is kind of like the emo, angsty, goth kid, you yeah. know, kind of character. Yeah. Um, Erikose is that savage, brute kind of, um, you know, more brutal character. And then you've got uh, uh, Hawkmoon, who is kind of that experimental, weird, (laughs) you know. Um, And I think think Quorum was that nice, you know, kind of um, midpoint. Yeah. Where as a a character, more relatable. And so I thought that would be a really nice uh, entry point sort of for that universe. And um, each song would be kind of... um, because obviously it's just it's just me doing all the music at the moment, and I was I was hoping to one day you know turn this thing I don't know how which direction it was going to go in it was really just a um, I put out the um, the instrumental demos um, last year late last year yeah and that that's kind of the proof of concept of of what I would hope to do with this project eventually um, and basically what that is is to kind of have a, a musical kind of um, exploration into the Moorcock universe, pretty much. Currently, the project's kind of in demo mode, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah, it's it's in infant stage really at the moment. It's just me kind of conceptualizing how, how am I going to approach this sort of project. Um, but yeah, it's it's in very early stages right now. But that's the idea. So, what's the next stage of development? Um, well, more music and also finding uh, more players, more people I can collaborate with and work with, and and get these tracks to really sound as high quality as possible and uh, as good as possible. And just kind of getting people on board right now is, is the next phase, I guess. Um, but all the while I'm, I'm working on more tracks and more ideas and, and thinking about, you know, which is the correct kind of course to take this project to really, um, to really get it on the right path. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, even though we've, described it as you know in inverted commas in in demo mode i certainly would still encourage anybody who number one is into mocock and number two is into well let's get into subclassifications do we call it power metal i would just call it metal um but um but really um if you want to kind of break it down i guess dissect it i'd say it's got elements of speed metal elements of power metal elements of hair metal even (laughs) you know i mean i mean it can be really yeah anything i guess but that's i guess that's it's metal you know yeah i'm I'm pretty old school really i just i just tend tend to talk in terms of metal so that's Mm. absolutely fine by me but yeah i would encourage absolutely anybody out there as a a metal fan or a mocock fan to absolutely get on your Bandcamp page and download it because even in its current state, it's terrific and it really showcases your talents, not just as a composer, but as a multi-instrumentalist. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. So what else do you have in the pipeline? Are you looking at anything else or are you just focusing purely on Corum? Oh, well, I'm, I'm working on a few things right now. Um, obviously, I've mentioned I'm a huge Solomon Kane fan, a huge Robert E. Howard fan, so at the moment I'm actually um, working on my own 
pulp, my own sort of um, Solomon Kane inspired pulp. Um, so I'm working on that at the moment and I've got a sample chapter ready to go. I'm doing all the illustrations and that myself and, oh, and writing that myself. So um, I'm happy to, you know, send you a sample of that if you'd like. And Oh yeah, I'd love to I'm have a look at that. Yeah, I'm, I'm working on that right now. And um, and additionally, I'm doing a soundtrack for a video game right now, but I'm not allowed to really go into that. Uh, that's supposedly scheduled for around 2024. But um, So I'm working on a soundtrack for that and I'm really excited about that. It's that's kind of a dream. Fantastic. It's kind of a dream project for me. So, um, yeah, but that's yeah, that's pretty much what I'm currently doing right now. That sounds absolutely so, terrific. So, who were your musical inspirations then that led you to to be a a, a metal multi instrumentalist and, and songwriter? Hmm. Um. Oh, oh, so many to name, but um, I think one of my biggest would have to be um, guitarists like Tony Iommi. Um, mm. from Black Sabbath, um, Glenn Hughes as a vocalist, one of my favorite. Oh, oh he's Glenn also, Hughes. Uh, um, just liquid yeah. gold of a voice. Absolutely and, amazing. And, and still, um, putting out music. He sounds better than he's ever sounded before, which is fucking insane. Yeah. And, and he just, he's putting out, um, singles and albums left and right and he's brilliant. And so, yeah, he's definitely up there for me. Um, Oh man, there's there's just so many, but um, I guess I could go through some bands that have really influenced me over the years. Judas Priest, a big one, of course. Um, Except King Diamond, you know. Yeah. yeah. Cla- classic eighties stuff, really. All that. Yeah, I, I thought it. I thought there might be a bit of Judas Priest in there with all that twin guitar attack. Stuff. Oh yes. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely, and and uh, huge respect for those bands, and and I mean, I honestly. I, I don't think you metal would be the same without that Judas Priest sound, those twin guitar harmonies and, and all that. It's it's very much they've defined that genre. Yeah. And it was they were also very clean as well, weren't they? I think there were a lot of a lot of bands that came after them that that kind of duplicated that approach, you know, the twin guitar, the the rhythm and the lead mirroring each other, but they never did it as cleanly or as or as um, I don't know, what's the word? There's, there's something really synchronized and beautiful, but also very clean. I don't want to use the word clinical because it makes it sound not exciting. But there was there was something about the way KK Downing and Glenn Tipton did it that nobody else has ever been able to duplicate for me. Right, I I agree one hundred percent. Yeah, and I think too a big thing, um, especially in heavy metal, modern heavy metal, is there's this tendency to constantly tune guitars down, mm. and everything sounds lower and heavier. Um, and that's fine, you know, but um, that's not really the sound that I want. I'm like, I love to stick with the standard tuning guitars, you know, classic approach to, you know, heavy metal, just like, you know, the legends in, in that time, so, you know, yeah. 70s and 80s rock legends. And that yeah. that's really, th- those guys, th- that's who I look up to. Yeah, you know. it's funny you've mentioned three things, th- three bands there that are really, really close to my heart. One is Judas Priest, obviously. The other is Black <laughs> Sabbath, who were kind of at the opposite end with that wonderful. You certainly would never describe them as clean sounding, but that lovely right. down tuned S- guitar sludgy, stuff. Doomy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, so. and, and the rhythm section of of Bill Ward and Geezer Butler, you know, alongside Tony Iommi's guitar was just absolutely, very bluesy. Oh, you fantastic. Know? Yeah, and then you mentioned Glenn Hughes, and I remember we were, um, getting Stormbringer and Burn for the first time on vinyl oh, in the eighties, yeah. and being really taken aback initially, and you know, kind of almost offended as a thirteen-year-old that with with um, this switch from the Ian Gillan Deep Purple Mark II to something with almost like jazz-infused, honey-rich voice. Of of Glenn Hughes on some of those yeah. tracks and 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 the interchange between Coverdale and Glenn Hughes at the, at the time I kind of struggled a little bit with it but as as I got older and went on with it it's, it's actually my favorite Deep Purple hands down by a mile oh yeah and and don't sleep on um, Glenn Hughes with Black Sabbath either because that's some brilliant stuff as well yeah and he's done a couple of solo albums with Tony Iommi as well not solo he's done oh, a couple of albums with Tony I love Iommi those. Yeah. which are absolutely mm-hmm. fantastic too absolutely. Yeah. 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 So, what track would you like us to play the show out with? Um, good question. Whichever you like, I don't, I don't mind. <laughs> which of, of which of the songs on that car and band camp list is is the real you know proud baby of yours? Yeah, I would say um, maybe into the mirror. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay, cool. We'll we'll play the show out with that. Sounds good. Yeah. Well, you know what? Thanks for coming on. It's been an absolute delight. Um, I can't wait to hear the next iteration of what you're doing. And uh, once you get to that next stage, it'd be great if you could come back on again and talk about it again. Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I really do. In fact, I <laughs> I kind of wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, the Alric TV show. <laughs> oh, <laughs> if, it ever, um, if it ever happens. Oh, if yeah, only. Well, well, see what... Um, I, I know it was cancelled, right, because of the uh, the Witcher. People saying it was too similar to The Witcher, which yeah. pissed me right off mm. because I thought I thought The Witcher show was an absolute plunker. I never got through but, it. Yeah, it's awful. But um, I think people are having having sort of the wrong approach. I think I think Alric, the series for Alric, I think it should be animated. I think they should get animated mm. with it. I think, and I, if you look at stuff like you know Blur Studios, the, the kind of animation that they do, I think would be amazing. Yeah, I think um, some kind of anime or um, something, getting someone like, I mean, I don't think they ever would, but getting someone like Tarsem Singh to do it. Um, so it was really super abstract and and, right. and, and different. So, I mean, Tarsem Singh's films, I, I, I'm not entirely sure all of them have been entirely successful. He did that one with Jennifer Lopez and Vincent D'Onofrio about her going into the mind of a serial killer. On the whole, not a great movie, but all of the scenes in his head are absolutely staggeringly beautiful and different and mind blowing. And then right, he did yeah. that. They did that film, um, uh, Immortals, which was a bit, which kind of failed because it came across as a three hundred knockoff. But mm. when when you actually just watch it on its own merit and the imagery and how dark some of it is, and in particular, um, I, I don't know what the Australian version of it was like but in the uk they edited it and made all the blood black <laughs> for, wow to, to to get it a, a, a lower certificate to get it in the cinema yeah um, on a 12 certificate so i got the german blu-ray which which is ironic considering germany tends to be um a little bit harder or has been a little bit harder on censorship over the years than than even the uk i got the german version where all the blood is is gloriously you know blood colored and it's a it's a staggeringly beautiful film. It's weird, it's um, it's stylistic. Okay, so there are some questionable costumes on the the gods of Olympus, but I think someone like Tarsem Singh could do a great job with it. But the real key is, is to pick some of the most psychedelic out there stuff that's happened in the Elric books and really go to town on it to mark it out as completely different. Yeah, don't hold back on the weird because that's really what's going to separate it from everything else. That's what's going to separate it from Witcher and Game of Thrones is the weird. Yeah. You know, it, it is that psychedelic, what the fuck am I looking at, yeah, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think even uh, a visionary like Guillermo del Toro yeah. even. Um, well, he's, he's kind of done Elric already, hasn't he? Exactly, <laughs> yeah, yeah. See, he's a fan. Yeah, so, yeah definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I think we're we're very much in agreement on that, and I think it it will be one of the greatest crimes in all of television if because The Witcher happened, we don't get an Elric TV series. That would be a real bummer. Yes, and it's okay to be salty about it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And <laughs> only a couple of years ago, the BB I think it was the BBC announced that they got the rights to the history of the Rune Staff, and then that's gone all quiet. Yes, um, so... uh, well, there was a uh, yeah, uh, so a Hawkmoon show, and then. No news about it, nothing. Yeah, but ha having seen what the BBC did to War of the Worlds, I've, I'm mm. actually, on, on, on one hand I'm disappointed, on the other I'm thinking, oh, thank Maybe fuck. we dodged, yeah, maybe we dodged a bullet, yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> that War of the Worlds adaptation was one of the worst things I've ever seen. Ugh. I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. tell you, most of my adult life, and actually most of my life in general, I've been waiting for a War of the Worlds adaptation set in mm. the original time, with the tripods, yeah. you know, um, that that would be faithful, mm. and it, it it was it pained me greatly when it finally came out to say that the Timothy Hines nineties version made for about ten bob and a pickled egg was a better adaptation than the BBC <laughs> one. <laughs> and I don't know if you ever came across that. It was doing the rounds on DVD back in those days. No, I'm pretty sure. I think I think I I watched it when I was a kid for sure yeah. because it was, it was genuinely terrible. But it was <laughs> it was full of passion for the original, and it was a faithful adaptation. 
and mm. then you see someone like the BBC with all their resources um, uh, have a take on it and you get that usual modern thing of and this is what I don't want with an Elric adaptation and I don't want with a Hawkmoon adaptation is someone to come along some BBC darling or some other television darling scriptwriter to think, yeah, all this is fine, but actually all these key scenes and all these iconic moments, I think I can do them better. I was like, no, mm. <laughs> please no. Reinterpretations, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, speaking of reinterpretations, I absolutely love what the the French Bond SNA, Elric, um, what they did. They reinterpreted sort of a lot of, um, I, think, I think even Moorcock, said he preferred their take. Is that the Julia Blondell one? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I've, I've got the first two, and I was aware Moorcock um, said that had he written it again and he was younger, he would have incorporated some of their bits and bobs, and he, he, he felt like it was one of the best adaptations. I absolutely adore the artwork. I think it's mm. fabulous. But script-wise, I'm not sold, because mm. I, I think they, they just make too many changes to the actual character of Elric which take him away from 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 what he was he's not he's not a doomed emo kid in those he's a decadent he's just about as evil as the rest of the Melnibonians and and, and they reduce the separation um, yeah. I've not got around to reading the third one but the artwork is absolutely it's all the gorgeous art, again the art is beautiful in the third one as well um, and there's a little bit of a twist to it too without spoiling anything and I, I believe there's a fourth and final one coming out where they're kind of amalgamating um, the Dreaming City and another possibly Seas of Fate story just kind of yeah. into into one, which the um, the cover art for that is beautiful. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to reading that, um, knowing that it's the final one and everything. So I kind of oh, cool. wish, actually, I, I would I would love to see these guys uh, tackle something like Solomon Kane because I know that they've done adaptations for Conan. And, uh, right. and I, I'm kind of... Um, I'm kind of starving for more Solomon Cain, to be honest. So, mm. um, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I think we're much in agreement on most of that, but I will um, persevere with the Julian Blondell um, adaptations of Elric and, and see where it goes. Because, I mean, quite apart from anything else, I could just stare at the artwork for ages. It's beautiful. Right, so I've got one more question for you. How warm is it in Melbourne? Oh, well, it's it's Melbourne, so one day it's warm and the next day it's cold and then in the morning it's cold and in the evening it's hot. So <laughs> it's the most spasmodic weather you could imagine. Um, well, just, and to that's... A, just, just to put some context on things, um, it's been between minus five and minus three here for, for the last Oof. few days. So the fact that I'm talking to someone on the other side of the world, I just want to vicariously enjoy some nice weather. <laughs> yeah, well, sometimes... <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, you know what, it's been great and uh, I look forward to having you back again when we get some more developments and maybe we think of some other things to talk about. It's been lovely having you on. Absolutely, thank you very much. All right, cheers, no worries. Big thanks and gratitude to both Nathan and the artist called Elric for coming on the show to talk about Moorcock, their passions and their projects. As we progress and evolve the show, music is coming more into the mix and we have a couple more very groovy guests lined up over the next month or two. In the meantime, I've been doing a bit of work on the journal and we're producing a sort of chapbook version of chapters 1-6. to six. That's a work in progress just for the sheer hell of it and I'm getting some assistance from frequent collaborator and the guy behind most of the show logo and I didn't work, our very own Simon Perrins. The plan is to knock one of these out every six or so chapters. So probably every couple of months, perhaps. Anything to give me a diversion from the day job right now is very welcome, and this podcast and everything around it, and every one around it, remains a great source of therapy. So, thanks for listening to the show, and thanks in bigger heaps to our Chaos Engineers, tiredly trying to convince Brute of Lashmar that breaking into the blind steersman chat room actually does constitute a breach of ship's rules and will entail ten lashes. So that's Andrew Cicluna, Andrew Van Ness, Fred, Dave, Jim, John Lays, John Watt, Nelbert, Simon Perrins, Robbo and Malpertwee and Ben. And to our swish and svelte jugaderos, shaking off those snowball hangovers, I'm wondering what drinks should accompany the corporal punishment. Clarkie, Craig, 
Loz, Matthew, Randall, Steve, Tom, Ian, Mark, Alex and Graham. And to our patron demons, Master Picanti, Lord Norman, the Baker on the Rocks, the Lapsed Gamer, Dread Mortmain, Robert Macmillan, Joe Monty, and our new arrival and guest on today's show, Nathan, a.k.a. Coram Mel. But last, but certainly not least, to Sir Neil of Burton, the Destiny Knight, currently down with the Rona. Stay strong, Sir Knight. I want, nay need, that Wallacey adventure when all of this is over. Right, that's about it from me for now. Gerard Arthur Connolly returns after the transition, and stay tuned as the show is played out with Into the Mirror by Coram. But before I go, don't forget, you can follow and gather us on Twitter and Instagram with the handle at Breakfast Ruins. You can email us at breakfastruins at outlook.com. The blog is breakfastintheruins.com. We have our Patreon page too, and we're out there on most podcatchers. If you have a favourite and we're not on it, drop me a line and I'll see what I can do about it. But meanwhile, stay safe and I'll see you soon on the Moonbeam Roads. The Journal of Gerard Arthur Connolly Chapter 8 On and on through the never It's a strange thing being adrift It affects one's sense not only of place and occasion but of identity and even skin In the small hours between scraps of sleep I don't so much dream as experience vivid moments Within them I know I'm me I accept it without question despite the sensation of differences Muscular pectoral slabs, for example, and thighs so swollen with cord-like tension, my legs twitch for an hour after rising. Or a head of wild, tangled curls atop my lanky frame, much unlike my working one. Or a shattered knee that never fully healed. There are always things, too. A sword that I named Bogdan, a gift from my friends. A broken monocle. A futuristic automobile, orange, chasing me around winding lanes. A stylized M, the only motive. A place, a town, on the edge of a vast gully. Shroud? A walking stick. The pommel, a poorly rendered dog's head in brass, and a cape to shield against bitter East Anglian rains. But all of these things and senses fade on waking, leaving only scraps and impressions and most frequently a sense of deja vu. This was now laying over me like the fog of 25 lit woodbines in the officers club at Coltishall Aerodrome, in another Europe altogether. My Europe. It was at Coltishall that I first encountered a fog such as this. Sotted on Long Life Lager and Benedictine Chasers, I'd staggered from the club back towards my billet. The air was crisp and heavy, penetrating my fatigue with damp that as I stumbled over the uneven and poorly tendered grass, began to take on a bitter taint as it runnelled from my moustaches onto my lips. This made little sense, as, like most everything at Her Imperial Majesty's aerodromes, except perhaps the manners and nails of the crew of Kingston-upon-Hull engineers assigned to the Victoria Imperatrix, the grounds were impeccably maintained. I was too drunk to take it all on board, however, and it was only when I realised that I should have sighted the officers' barracks after trudging clumsily for a couple of minutes, it dawned on me that my path appeared to have gone awry. It became even more apparent as muddy, viscous water began to reach the ankles of my treasured Go Hills boots that had been the envy of my comrades since Camden Town had become the Camden Crater. It was cemented when a fat, lazy, luminous bug half the width of my clenched fist drifted across my path. Almost as drunkenly as me, it wended its way into a now cloying mist. Sensing something of an emergency, I paused and tried to light a capstan full strength and restore some clarity and focus to my thinking, but my matches were useless in this air. Leaving my Dunhill cigarette lighter in my quarters had seemed a good idea at the time, given that our German exchange colleague, Klosterheim, 
was constantly trying to gamble for it. But now I would have kicked myself had the ewes not been rising further up my beautiful boots and beginning to penetrate. Horrified at the thought of permanent damage, I lurched forward in search of firmer ground, although directionless and increasingly disorientated. After more blind stumbling, boots and socks now saturated, and with the chill creeping up my 100% wool breeks, I made for a soft glow in the mist. Entirely unexpectedly, I came upon a low, ramshackle wharf of ancient warped timber that extended into the gloom. At the end closest to me were a small table and a couple of short three-legged stools. On the table was a sort of globe, waxed paper over a wire frame, as I discovered when I examined it. Some kind of objects were inside, and when I shook it they sounded like old dried beans or something similar, and the agitation set them to glowing and flitting around inside. More agitation, and the globe cast a warm glow, illuminating and appearing to repel the mist around me somewhat. Further down the wharf, I was now able to discern chains, hooks, tackle, and two more of these globes. The owners were nowhere to be seen, and the gear was corroded. An old food can, sans label, and a vintage mess tin of some type, were the only sign that any person had been here in any way recently. I took advantage of one of the stools, and, thanks to the retreat of the heavy mist, managed to light a capstan. The harsh rush of that unique and brutal tobacco dispelled the sweetly acidic Benedictine repeaters, and I considered my situation as more green thorax bugs moved closer to investigate the glow. Lightheaded, I thought about my position. I had no idea where I was, how I'd come to be there. For a moment, I did wonder if I'd somehow become so drunk that I'd gone off the aerodrome on autopilot and wandered into some hitherto unknown to me swamp. But the massive bugs and the weird articles, including the wharf, suggested otherwise. I was somewhere else. Ruminating on the possibilities, and failing in general to make any sense of things, I failed to notice movement beyond the end of the wharf until something bulky and black and reflective as tar hauled itself onto the ancient planks, causing some to give and splinter with a strangled half-cry as they struggled to bear the tremendous mass. Shocked and dragged back into the moment, I dropped the cigarette butt and my hand instinctively reached for my sidearm, still holstered back in my billet. I cursed loudly as my instincts, despite it having dawned on my brain that it was futile, steered my hands to my missing boarding saber, still scabbarded aboard the Victoria Imperatrix. The horror from the swamp, sensing my helplessness, tittered and lurched towards me. <laughs>